Okay. Let's do anything that this dragon asks of us. If our course of action is decided, let's not tarry. That we should encounter one of the first brood in such a circumstance. Tell me about it. My apologies, but given that the city is currently in a state of alert, I cannot let you proceed past this point. That meeting took a rather unexpected turn, but we now have a clear objective ahead of us. Let us rejoin our comrades in Charlian and muster a suitable crew for our foray into the Tower of Zot. Oh, and if you haven't already done so, be sure to attune to the Aetherite here before departure. Unless, of course, you enjoy violent nausea. <laughs> well, I did already goof that and fixed it, so... You can thankfully get back here by talking to the same lady. But I, <laughs> I, did, I did teleport out of the zone before I first attuned to the Aetherite, so... Let's go to Charlian. It's also, this is such a silly little detail, but it's something that just got me so happy. Opening up that teleportation list for the first time to go, I think I will teleport to old Charlian, and then clicking on it, it is just a special expansion feeling, you know? Seeing that list expand, now it's even longer and harder for me to find where I need to go. <laughs> I almost kind of wish that they had something that was, like a, um, a way you could compact the view on it. So you could just see, maybe there is, and I'm just a goober and I haven't noticed. Hold on. No, okay, no, there's not. Where you could just like actually compact it. I guess technically you can just go through by this, but I'd like to see everything. Just, boop, you know, have these just s sort of sandwiched in there so I could just have like Black Shroud, Thanel, and Curthus, and then be able to click it and then go from there. That would be so nice. All right, so we're going in. This building, every time, it convinces me. Okay, nope, yep, we're fine. <laughs> it did it again! It convinces me every time that that's where I wanna go and it is not where I wanna go. Back to our other friends. I really enjoy the music in here. It's a good time. Welcome back, Valka. Ready for a nap? No, I'm good. I'm gonna go in here, though. I just thought you might have some new dialogue. We ha Come on, we have to be getting close to the tower. We have to be getting close to the first dungeon. I, I said, I was like, I don't know, an hour and a half ago, two hours ago, I went out of this room for a quick refresher on my water. And I said to my partner, Bebop, I went, I think I'm almost to the dungeon. And then I just came out after the dragon reveal because I was just so hyped. And Bebop went, weren't you almost at the dungeon two hours ago? And I went, I mean, you're not wrong, but dragons happen, so I'm not really complaining. If there's a reason for me to not be in the dungeon right now, let it be dragons, and it was. <laughs> and I am overjoyed. Vitra and his alchemist have prepared for us uh, a foray into the tower. What we may accomplish within its twisted holes remaineth to be seen. That Arcasodra languish in Telophoroi chains doth forewarn us of the nature of our foe. Tis the gods of Thavnir who will be summoned to thwart us. The conflict between Nidhogg and I is in the past, and though they were brothers, it has no bearing of my view on Vitra. Above all else, he is a leader of men, not an enemy. He would hardly dedicate his life to this endeavor if he bore our kind any ill will. I agree with you, Astinian. I am waiting for a moment where, I don't know, Nidhogg speaks within Astinian or something, and Astinian can relay some heart-wrenching message to the rest of the brood. Who knows if it'll happen, but it would absolutely destroy me, so... Just as I was getting used to Bolmi Thavnaya, we're back in chilly Charlian. Take care not to catch your death, eh? We need you for the battles to come. <laughs> That's not at all ominous! <laughs> now then, your investigation here remains, but when that's over, we can take stock of all of the developments and discoveries. Oh. My. God. Are they really not gonna let me do that dungeon? Do I not do that dungeon until I do Charlian? Are you serious? Are you serious right now? 
this maybe does feel a little bit too long to not have had any content. <laughs> I mean, I am not complaining because I love the story. The story is amazing. It's amazing and it's been so good so far. But I really thought they would have us in a piece of content by now. I really thought we'd have something on the table. I returned by way of Kite's experimental aetherite, yet I must say, it was far less taxing than our first attempt, and apparently we need only ask if we wish to use it again. Now, I'm not terribly eager to repeat the experience, but if you're willing to test your ethereal fortitude for the sake of technological advancement, then who am I to stop you? Let's figure out why the former's behaving weirdly. An unsettling change has come over Charlian, but together we will divine the underlying cause for the Forum's callousness. As I mentioned before, however, questioning the counselors directly is a fruitless endeavor. They seem to have already come to a consensus as to what and how little they are willing to divulge. Which is why I began scouring Charlian's archive of historical records for any hint of a connection to the final days. Suffice it to say that progress has been slow. There are only so many dusty pages one can skim in a day, but now that I have this band of willing reinforcements, the search should proceed all the swifter. Let us reconvene outside the Numenon, shall we? Exit the annex to the right, and you'll find the archives on the western edge of the woods. I think, honestly, in retrospect, for the flow of the story, I probably would have chosen to do Charlie and first and then Thavnair. I am glad that we got to go because there's a lot of really exciting stuff in Thavnair, but for all that they tell you that they suggest that you should start with Thavnair first, it really feels like if that first dungeon is Tower of Zot, it really feels like you should do Charlie and first, and then for the flow of the story, go to Thavnair and then do the stuff there. Um, unless, I mean, maybe there is another dungeon that opens up before Zot. I'm, I'm not totally sure. Okay, we are going down here. It's a beautiful sunny day, though! Look at it! Oh my gosh. My directions were easy enough to follow, I hope. In any case, you stand now before the doors of Numenon, Charlian's grandest collection of books and tomes. This building is actually only an entrance, and one of many at that, for the archives of Numenon extend deep beneath, uh, beneath the surface like the roots of a tree. The vast halls of the Great Google Library pale in comparison to Numenon's endless maze of subterranean chambers. Any citizen of Charlian is free to enter and peruse its shelves. Well, most of its shelves. Only Archons are afforded access to certain restricted vaults. I've dispatched Ishtola and Raha to investigate those. Meanwhile, Alice and Alfina will help me continue my search through the stacks open to the general public. Your status presents more of a problem. <laughs> As a non-citizen, you are only permitted to browse the first floor here at the entrance. Even so, there should be a number of books which touch upon Charlie and history or foreign policy. Your task will be to find and study the relevant publications. I promise you, a working knowledge of those subjects will make it far easier to spot the sort of clues we're looking for. Let's be about it, shall we? I've told the others to meet us at the stone benches over there once they found some promising tomes. Happy reading! Oh yeah! Library trip! I trained my whole life for this. Let's go. <sighs> this building... It's just, oh, it is just something else. The scale, the scope, the design. I just, oh, I just, it's so good. I'm assisting my colleague in his hunt for research materials, specifically a thesis by Moonbrida, but it's difficult to find any one tome in a library of this size. I'm so happy they mentioned a lot about Moonbrida in here. I'm so glad, I'm so glad. We apologize for the inconvenience, but the reference desk is currently experiencing an unusually high volume of requests. Please stand by until this issue is resolved. 
I'm just here looking for some tomes. I need to reference for my thesis. I'm just here looking for some tomes. I need to reference for my thesis. It's all one sentence. I know how to talk good. Luckily for me, if a tome exists, it's almost certainly somewhere in the Numenon. Okay, let's see. Stewards of Wisdom. During the chaos of the Sixth Umbral Calamity, Archon Nuncrap, founder of Charlene, bore witness to the madness and savagery of men brought to the brink of despair. Upon raising a settlement on an island in the Northern Empty, he instructed his people thus, renounce the ways of war, and pursue enlightenment through knowledge and reason. The Charlenes took to heart the words of their savior, and thenceforth, and thenceforth served as stewards of wisdom. Upon a foundation of accumulated learning, they built a homeland unlike any other, a nation born from strength of minds rather than strength of arms. With knowledge of economics came shrewd trading, with knowledge of agriculture came bountiful crops, engineering brought wells and sewers, ending squabbles over water. Wealth of expertise could be bartered for wealth and coin, and the more their wisdom spread throughout the world, the more mankind as a whole would thrive. And so it was, that no matter the trials and tribulations of the age, the citizens of Charlian would live by their founder's teachings, for the sake of a better tomorrow, for the sake of a brighter star. They would eschew the tools of war, and with knowledge, deliver the world. The Voice of a Growing City In the years which followed the founding of Charlian, civic policy and other matters of import were decided at the Ecclesia, a public forum at which every citizen was eligible to speak. All this good knowledge they're bringing in from the lore books and other sources. As the city's population grew, however, this format became increasingly impractical. The larger number of participants gave rise to ever longer debates, resulting in significant delays of vital resolutions. Various measures were introduced in an attempt to curtail protracted discussions, but in the year 201 of the Sixth Astral Era, it was ultimately decreed that Charlian would transition to a new form of governance. The nation would now be led by a body of 99 members, citizens chosen from amongst their peers by means of a nationwide vote. Thus was the form as we know it today conceived and created. This is very nice to have as a little touch base. That's honestly why I wanted to do those lore tour videos as opposed to just like a run around the city because there's so much information between the lore books and the game itself and you know even 1.0 stuff and anything else that is kind of up for grabs for building out a lot of these places and grounding people in understanding what the context of these different locations are. Especially something like Charlian, which has been mentioned like since the beginning of the game, you know? So it is so important, I think, to have an idea just of the whole context and how it all fits together, um, which is why we made those videos, but honestly, it's also so, so nice that they put these little tidbits in so that even if people don't own the lore books, even if people don't remember something that they might have read years ago, they can still get a sense of what's happening. Why does Granville seem familiar to me? I am rather in the middle of something, so if you wouldn't mind leaving me to my research, thank you. Okay, Granville, well, I hope I don't remember you because you <laughs> because you were rude. Roads of old, the colony. The city-state of Charlian. Many years ago, on the banks of the Thaliac in the Dravanian hinterlands, a Charlian colony once thrived. This settlement was originally established as a mere outpost to study the ethereal sea in the year 1311 of the Sixth Astral Era. Scholars dispatched to Eorzea found the facilities wanting, and their demands encouraged a gradual expansion in structures and services. As rumors spread of a growing community of academics, the area was further inundated with Eorzean students hoping to share in the renowned wisdom of the Charlians. Fifty years later, the Forum passed a motion to recognize what had become a flourishing town as an official Charlian colony. Eorzean residents took to calling uh, the colony itself Charlian, which led to no small amount of confusion when discussions turned to the subject of the motherland. In response, some Charlian inhabitants, if pressed for a name, would simply refer to it as Emporium. Following the Great Exodus, however, goblins and treasure hunters claimed for themselves a corner of the abandoned colony and gave it yet another name, Idleshire. Uh, the following chapters go on to introduce the most prominent features of, the, of Idleshire. The book does not appear to contain additional information on the form or cover the history of Charlie and Motherland in greater detail. Brightly colored book? The story of Charlian? Is this for kids? It has to be. 
Long, long ago, on an island in the northern sea, there lived a Rugadan man by the name of Nuncrep. Nuncrep was a student of astrology, and he divined that a flood of terrifying proportions would soon sweep over the lands of Eorzea. So it was that he built a gigantic ship, assembled a crew, and set sail for that imperiled realm. The flood arrived as foretold, and to their horror, the strangely churning waters drove the people towards the ocean. It was there, however, that Nuncrap's crew hauled them aboard his ark, but the danger had not passed. A towering wave approached, threatening to smash the vessel to pieces. With only moments to spare, Nuncrap wove a mighty spell of teleportation and shifted the entire ship to safety atop Abalathia's spine, which you can actually see in-game. It's still there. The actual ark is there, um, and we have footage of it and stuff in that video and a reenactment of all of this. Refugees from the surrounding regions huddled there alongside them. But it was not long before disputes over the dwindling supply of food led to violence and bloodshed. Saddened by the sight, Nuncrep gathered to him his crew and his grateful passengers, and abandoned the Ark to those reddened peaks. They journeyed to the coast where they built a new ship, intent upon returning to the northern seas. They landed on the beach of an island and settled upon that very spot. That settlement prospered and grew, and in time, it became the city of Charlene we live in to this day. We have gained a fundamental understanding of Charlene history and the foundation of the form. Head outside to the rendezvous point. It's good to have this touch base even if I recently... Oh, we didn't talk to this person. Even if I recently already recovered uh, or recounted a lot of this for myself. Oh, were you looking for a specific tome? Only Archons may check out forbidden tomes, but if there's anything else you require, simply say the word. This is why everybody's here! Little gathering spot. Wait and see. Get more information. Especially if they're gonna heavily reference any of that stuff, it's probably good that they just incorporated it in. Hey friends, it feels like it's been a million years! Sorry, were you waiting long? I wanted to make sure I'd borrowed at least a few promising volumes. Alfino and Kryl should also be along shortly. I was delayed in similar fashion. As far as I could see, no titles in the Archon Stacks mentioned the final days specifically, so we have no choice but to start with the tangentially related tomes, if they are even that. At present, the plan is to skim through as quickly as we dare, and share our discoveries as we make them. It would have been nice to invite everyone to the estate. Plenty of comfortable places to read, and a supply of hot tea. Oh, I was always quite fond of reading outside. But it's not about the little pleasures, is it? You miss your home. It's been... difficult. After our arrival, we managed to speak with one of the family servants and ask how things were. It seems our dear father has instructed the staff that even if Alphino and I were to return to Charlian, we were not to be allowed to cross the threshold. A harsh measure indeed. I hope that our efforts to understand his position and that of the Forum will perhaps lead to a reconciliation. We'll mend this rift one day, I'm certain of it. And what of you, Graha? Have you been to visit your family? Or do they not live here in the city? Ah, well, uh, my situation is also somewhat complicated. I was raised in Charlie, and yes, but I was born rather further away. In the southern reaches of Ilsebad, in fact. For generations, my people have dwelt in Corvos, the coastal region opposite of the island of Thavnaye. The Allegans founded a city in that fertile land, and by ship, brought in the subjugated tribes of the Mikote to serve as laborers. Of course, the massive earthquakes of the Fourth Umbral Calamity brought an end to the Empire's reign. And when the Fifth Calamity froze the sea solid, many of the tribes still living in Corvos braved the journey back to Eorzea. My ancestors, however, chose to remain, that they might prevent the remnants of Allegan technology from being misused. That's excellent! This is a little tidbit we I don't remember hearing much about, honestly. Isn't Corvus under Garlean ruin? Goodness, Garlean rule! I can tell. 
It's been a long day of recording because my ability to read and then translate the words into into spoken words is, is very hard, but we're doing our best and I'm gonna rally here. For the past 50 years, yes. Some semblance of local culture remains, as is the case for most imperial provinces, but Garlemald renamed the region Locus Aminus. When I was a boy, a nearby town came under the jurisdiction of an illustrious imperial family, the nobles of House Darnus. House Darnus demonstrated a singular interest in elegant civilization, and so my tribe was forced to consider a plan of action. For some time already, voices had been raised in favor of abandoning our ancient customs. After all, the elegant eye no longer passed to our eldest children as reliably as it once had. Fear of discovery eventually tipped the scales, and the decision was made to bury our ties to the knowledge and traditions of Alec. As the last child born with the elegant eye, I was given over to the custody of friends and the students of Baldessian, who had me registered, who had me registered as a Charlian citizen. I never even considered. Forgive me, it, it was an unkind question. Even Thancred was taken in by Archon Louisois, was he not? Stories of adopted waifs and rescued orphans are more common amongst Charlians than you might think. Yet, regardless of our origins, we are all provided with an equal opportunity to learn, and with sufficient uh, <laughs> sagacity. I think that's what it is. We outsiders can even earn the vaunted title of Archon. Tis exactly why I have such a love for this country, and why I wish it to remain a nation of which its citizens can be proud. Hear, hear! Another good reason to get to the bottom of the form's stubbornness, aside from the trifling matter of our impending doom. Excuse us while we try to make some headway into these books, Valka. More company should be arriving any moment now. Tidbits and lore and good things for days. Good stuff for days. So, Darnus being the house affiliated with Niel, right? Am I remembering correctly? Niel... Uh, Niel... Zos, but nope, not Zos, it wouldn't be Zos. <laughs> this has always been. Hold on, hold on. We've got the power of Google on our side. Vaughn, was it Niall Von Darnus? Yes. Niall Von Darnus. Um, which, again, Binding Coils, if anybody didn't know, um, Binding Coils of Bahamut, there's a reference there, but Niall was also, and I was not in 1.0, so this is me just recollecting again. But 1.0 also played a fairly large part, and we find out that a lot of shenanigans and nonsense happened, and Niall had died, and, and Niall's sister was being Niall, and there's just a whole bunch of stuff with binding coils that kind of gets revealed, and if you didn't know previously what had happened in 1.0 or anything like that, it might be a little bit confusing. Um, the White Raven was Niall's name, so a lot of uh, the, the earrings that were even put in game, the White Raven earrings that we got were actually, I believe, a reward from some of the finale of 1.0 and that's why a lot of people were kind of like why did they get put into the game it's just kind of an offhanded thing when they were such an important legacy item I think it's actually cool to see the history of the game still be reinterpreted and put in in ways that people can have those hints and tidbits um, but you can do a little reading and research on that figure if you're curious there are others better suited to poring over old history books, so I thought I'd try my luck with more recent events. If I can find anything to better inform the form's baffling behavior. Hmm, what else do I know of Corvos? Precious little, I'm afraid. I've not returned since Master Galef first brought me here. I can tell you that Corvosi rebels still seek to slip the yoke of their Imperial masters, though the fighting is far less fierce than it once was. Oh, and they have carpets! Flying carpets! The, le uh, the legends are quite extraordinary. Maybe there's a mention of it in the flying carpet mount. That would be really great. That would be very, very fun. I wonder if we're going to end up going there. The mention of it makes me think maybe it's like a map affiliated with Garlemald we haven't been to yet or that we might go to in the expansion, but it also seems like it could just be a little toss away thing. Where they're just kind of giving a little bit more information and fleshing out the map a little more. We've returned with our selections. Although, I must say, the pickings were quite slim indeed. Mistress Cryle has already flicked through every history book devoted to disasters, and more than a few which barely make mention of them. 
As such, we will be looking into research papers on the umbral calamities, as well as articles written by prominent forum members. Perhaps their knowledge of the final days comes from an unexpected source. Speaking of which, might I ask you a few questions related to the final days? I'm the only one here who didn't witness the events of Amorat firsthand, and fear I may be overlooking critical details. My thanks. Now, where to begin? First things first. What kind of phenomena did the ancient encounter as the final days drew nigh? Ooh, the worst kind you can imagine! Um, I would say complete destabilization of creation magics. Is that phenomenon, which would technically be like a tangible event that occurred? I guess, because it did lead to strange summons and things like that. Primals feel like more of a, a, a tangible event, but I'm sure this doesn't really matter. <laughs> a complete destabilization of creation magics. Yes, the unfolding catastrophe brought havoc on all manner of life. The chaos extended to the ancients themselves, causing their powers of creation to spiral out of control. Fear and despair manifested in terrible, tangible fashion. Meteors raining from the sky, fire erupting from the ground. Indescribable abominations prowling the streets. That more or less aligns with my understanding. If only the arts of creation had survived until the present day, we might have had something substantial to analyze. Summoning! <laughs> Summoning. <laughs> Yes, summoning rituals! But also, summoners were taught, I believe. They're, that draws from ancient Alig, which was taught by the Asians. To the best of our knowledge, however, those techniques were not preserved or passed on. Ishola surmises that the closest known magic is that of the summoning rituals promulgated by the Asians. Was there aught else of note which heralded the approach of the final days? Ooh. <gasps> this one! They say it began with a keening sound from the earth itself. The land itself, maybe it was. Oh, yes. The Amoratine spoke of it, didn't they? We never did hear this sound ourselves, of course, thrust as we were into the midst of the madness. But it seems that each and every one of the catastrophes was preceded by this ominous noise. Eventually, it resounded all across the star, and not even Amorot was spared. So the ground was crying out, you say? To be considered the harbinger of doom, it must have been quite distinctive, and probably quite loud. I'll have to speak with one of the Numenon's mammoths and ask after any books which make mention of such a sound. Last but not least, would you describe how the ancients sought to quell this unprecedented calamity? What definitive action did they take? Okay, on one hand, it does feel very good that they are really kind of going through this so that people are all on the same page and it is good to kind of I think even just from the writers mouths get the perspective of how, of how they want these things framed within the game and what events might be important but it does feel like a lot of this has just been kind of like the big recap episode which to be fair again 10 years of storytelling you're recapping for new players and old players alike I think this is necessary but Again, it kind of makes the pacing feel a little bit funny. Just a little funny after coming off of how things are ramping up in Thavnair. I think there's a lot of reasons why they did this. It's very practical to divide these up so that people, again, are actually, like, split between the zones. There's not horrible traffic jams. I know why they did it, and, and I fully understand. It's just kind of, uh, it's just kind of interesting. Um, it's a little slow for maybe those of us who already had a lot of this, like, we understood a lot of it and had been ruminating about it for a while, right? They summoned Zodiac. Yes, with Elidibus serving as his heart, so many gave themselves in sacrifice to bring him into being. We do not even know exactly how Zodiac brought salvation to the star, only that by his godlike will were the laws of nature set all right. Then, once the balance was redressed, the ancients offered up a further sacrifice to heal the ravages of the final days. Lives sprouted anew, and it was these fledgling souls they intended to render unto Zodiac, a trade that would have allowed them to resurrect the shades of loved ones absorbed by the primal. Or might have. 
had Vinod and her fellows not manifested their opposition in the form of Hydaelyn. Thank you, both of you, for the detailed review. I feel much more confident now in my understanding of events. With all that freshly in mind, it does make me wonder what the Telephori truly mean when they speak of bringing back the final days. We've seen what they're doing with those towers of theirs. Is forcing people to summon primals a kind of catalyst? Are they attempting to mirror the conditions caused by unstable creation magics? Or are they simply using the final days as a figure of speech? A convenient metaphor for the scale of destruction they plan to unleash. This is literally every content creator for the past year. Oh, but this is all just pointless conjecture at this stage. Let us return our attention to the forum, shall we? We should keep an eye out for Ishtola, but tis time we began studying these research papers. Time for more research! I'm ready! I saw this person spawn in and I went, Asian! <laughs> like immediately! Immediately in my head! Oh, okay, same thing that he said last time, but Alphano has something new because he wasn't here. Many forum members are also researchers or professors. If they know aught about the final days, then that knowledge might surface in their writing. Well, that is my hope anyway. Cryo! <laughs> Beautiful Hrothgar friend who's just looming over her. It really is comforting to have all these dedicated assistants on hand. Right then, enough chatting, more reading. Okay, third time's the charm. Let's read up a storm and see if Ishtola shows up. I'm the last, am I? Well, my extended research of the Archon stacks produced one or two possibly useful books. But I wouldn't get your hopes up. If you recall, Uriange learned of the source's reflections from the Geron Oracles. From its potential to cause panic and confusion, that tome was deemed apocrypha and sealed away in the Great Google Library. It was pretty Google! Google had a lot of really special tomes that were actually, like, the really rare ones were taken from Google and then brought here um, when they were doing the Exodus, but many, many others obviously were not. They were still in there, which is why you can go find them now. Tis even less likely that knowledge of the unsundered world, not to mention the horrors of the final days, would be left sitting on a shelf for any curious scholar to find. It stands to reason, then, that my colleagues, be they archons or counselors, should perforce be largely ignorant of the subject. Yet, when you confronted Master Fortuneau with knowledge of the Tlophoroi and their machinations, he scoffed at the suggestion that they posed a threat. He seemed adamant that the Forum would know if the final days were truly upon us, which only supports the conclusion that whatever privileged wisdom is guiding the Forum's behavior, it is being kept secret from the rest of the nation. Not that I mean to excuse myself from reading duty. Whether they contain mention of the final days or no, these books could yet hold something of value. You weren't thinking of leaving, were you? There's plenty of work for everyone. <laughs> I like reading. I read. I'll read until the early hours of the morning. We can go get coffee at the last sand. I am ready. You labor for what feels like an age as Ishtola's research assistant. I'm sorry, that text is false and inaccurate. If I was operating as, as Ishtola's research assistant, it would fly by. I'd be like, we've only been here for six hours. I need six more hours of Ishtola time. I love her. <laughs> Thank you for your help, but I think I can manage the rest without your assistance. If I were you, I'd steal a few quiet moments for myself. Oh dear, you look exhausted. But what about your studies? Were you able to find any books on the subjects I mentioned? Then the day was well spent. Should you wish to read them again, a moment at the reference desk will point you in the right direction. For the moment, though, I suggest you take a well-deserved rest. We might be occupied with our research for quite some time. <gasps> the quest music. 
Oh, I leveled up! That's why I got cut off! <laughs> Level 81, yay! Oh wait, hold up. Have these attacks changed? Your efforts to gain Grahatia's attention go unnoticed. He appears to be lost in his reading. I've found not of interest so far. I think Ishtola might be right about not getting our hopes up. Ready for tea break, Valka? I know I am. Honestly, my neck and shoulders are going to calcify if I don't stretch my legs and walk around for a bit. You know the last stand down in the harbor, don't you? Come and meet me near the tables outside and I'll treat you to their coffee. It's quite good. It's happening. It's happening! That's exactly what I wanted. I am so ready. Oh, we could have aetherited. Let's do that. Oh, the wait, there's a man here I haven't talked to yet. Bevis. Are you familiar with the wandering minstrel? The tales he spins never fail to engage and enthrall. What I wouldn't give to receive a masterclass in storytelling from the minstrel himself. That's cute. <laughs> minstrel Yoshida san. <sighs> This music is going to be stuck in, I was going to say in my head, but I really think it's going to be stuck in my soul forever. I'll go down to Scholar's Harbor. And then it's coffee break with Alice, my favorite time. I, in a future expansion, if we are like off doing other things, some other world, some other shard, some other, I don't know, some big thing that we don't know what's coming up. But if we don't have something before the end of this game, right? Like final X pack ever of Final Fantasy XIV, where we come back and Alphino and Alice are all grown up. I am going to be very disappointed. I want to see them as adults. I want to see them like actually age in the game and just know that we got to take that journey with them. It'd be so nice. Okay, I'll say is here. As busy as ever, I see. How very Charlian that no other gourmet cafe has sprung up to compete for customers. Actually, this crowd gives me an idea. Before we place an order, why don't we ask a few questions and gauge the mood of the city? I'm interested to hear what the average citizen has to say about the Tlaferoi. We might even learn something new. Worth a try, don't you think? Accompanying! Yay! What? What? What is it? Can a man not enjoy a moment of private respite? If you're looking to share a table, then I respectfully request that you look elsewhere. Oh, you misunderstand, sir. We were simply wondering if you knew of the Tlaferoi. These enemies of peace have promised an end to all we hold dear and... Wait... You're that house levier girl, aren't you? And this woman with you is obviously a foreigner. <laughs> I'd heard you were disowned for helping outsiders indulge their barbaric whims, and here you are giving truth to the rumor. I'll thank you to leave me be. I've not to say to the likes of you. <laughs> well, I must apologize. It was foolish of me to expect an ons of civility from one so enlightened. Come, Valka. I'll say will not be put down by nonsense talk. What does she say if I talk to her here? Oh, someone here will talk to us. All right, all right, all right. We can go inside. This place has to be just, well, I guess this is the thing, right? If there's only a, like a select group of actual people in Charlie and who appreciate fine dining, then I guess it makes sense that it wouldn't be constantly like, she mentioned that it's really busy, but like if we were in Chicago, for example, and there was only one restaurant that tasted good in the entire city, you would literally not be able to get reservations there for three years, <laughs> maybe longer. Yes, I don't believe I've had the pleasure. Pray excuse the interruption, but we were hoping you might share your thoughts on the Telophoroi and their unconscionable plans. My goodness, if it isn't the young Miss Leveilleur. My apologies, but I work in the offices of the farm, and if word reached Master Fortuna that I was helping you... I see. We're sorry to have bothered you. <laughs> Dickens gonna be like, I don't care. Yeah, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> what do you want to talk about? Okay. Welcome, madam. What can I offer you today? He got piercing blue eyes, though. Wait, 
Is that Mistress Alice I see there? My word! How long has it been? Far too long. Meet Dickon, the owner of the last stand. I used to frequent his cafe on occasion in between lessons at the studio. It seems like ages ago now. I remember hearing that you and Master Alfino had set sail for Eorzea, but then you never came back. Lately there's been gossip about your father disowning the pair of you. Everything alright at home? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's... complicated. And I hadn't expected complete strangers to be so familiar with our situation quite so quickly. Everyone has an opinion, it seems. Well, it is House Leveilleur. No matter how discreet Master Fortuno may have been, news of your family's doings never stays secret for long. Things being what they are, what brings you back to the city now of all times? We have questions, and only Charlian has the answers. Tell me, Master Dickon, have you heard anything about an apocalypse called the Final Days? What, like, an end of the world? Oh, nothing like that, I'm afraid. And that's what you're here to find out? Information on this apocalypse? Yes, whatever we can learn. Unfortunately, your patrons appear to be unwilling to speak with me. I wish there was more I could do to help. Maybe you can! Hmm, but maybe there is. You're a visitor to Charlian, aren't you? Then, few will know your face. We should be able to pass you off as a server with none the wiser. We just finished preparing a few orders. Strike up some friendly conversation while you're setting down the food, and you might just get the answers you're looking for. Not a bad idea. I hate to ask, but what do you think? I got it. I got it. Do I get a cute apron? That's the spirit. Pay attention now, and I'll explain where each of these dishes needs to go. The tea set is for the chatty group sitting by the water's edge. Tea, water. Tea by the water. Tea by the water, because if you... <laughs> this is, I'm gonna remember it. If you drink a lot of tea, you gotta pee. <laughs> gotta pee at Ocean's Worth. The omelette is for one of our regulars, a Highlander by the name of Gisla. She's sitting at an outlet. Oh, uh, at an outlet. Oh my gosh. She's sitting at an outside table with a friend of hers. Okay. Omelette, Gisla. Because a Highlander, their thighs are so powerful and so hot, hot, hot. That if you crack an egg on their thigh, you can, you can fry it up. <laughs> I would eat an egg off of a Highlander's thigh, I'm not gonna lie. Behind them, you should see a Mikote gentleman. He ordered the oven-baked lobster. Because cats like fish. Okay. Got all that? If you're not sure, just ask and I'll explain again. Good luck. Oh, I got it. T for P, egg on a Highlander. <laughs> And fish for a cat. I'm on it. I'm on it. I'm on it. Do I need to, like, put on a costume? I feel like they are definitely gonna know I'm not a server, but... I'll, I'll do whatever I can here. Down by the water, they said? What, over here? In the middle of nowhere? No, I gotta be... Hold on. Hold on. It's gotta be over here somewhere. Cafe table. The Makote? The lobster for the Makote? I don't see a Highlander here. This appears to be the only table that I can go to right now. Anything else that I can say? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try this. I think they maybe have us do it in an order. Yeah, this has to be the Makote. It has to be. Uh, we'll do oven baked lobster. This counts as being- I guess it is by the water! Dang it! Dang it! <laughs> Clear the dish away! Tea set. I thought they meant by the water, like, down there by the water, not over here, so I thought it would be like one of the tables over there. Oh, my tea set. Lovely, thank you. The Telefo- who? No, I'm sorry, I've never heard of them or their final days. My friends and I are somewhat uninformed when it comes to current events. Now, if you wanted to hear about ritual arcane practices of the Sixth Astral Era, common or esoteric, then I'd be happy to talk your ear off. Oh, dang, well, this is a call out for any of us that love lore. Alright, Gisla, Highlander, crack an egg. Highlander, crack an egg, I got it, I got it, I got it. Omelette. 
Ah, uh, finally. Two, four, six, eight. Let's dig in. No time to waste. What? The Talaferoi? Oh, yes. I remember seeing the name in the latest gazette. That and some grand claim about the end of days. Same old senseless warmongering. When will these fools grow tired of spilling each other's blood? Best stay out of it, I say. The Forum made the right choice, and I fully support our decision to remain neutral. Mikote! Urbane banter with a smile? What? Oh, I'm gonna do the lobster! But I'm tempted! At last, the oven-baked lobster is mine! You have no idea how long I've scrimped and saved and suffered to afford this heavenly dish. I think he's maybe the one that if you talked to him earlier, didn't he mention the lobster earlier? The final days? This is the first I've heard of it. Although, it would explain why my friend has been rushed off his feet. It must be a busy time to be a gleaner. Hmm? You don't know what a gleaner is? They're... Oh, collectors of sorts. Travel the world procuring things that we haven't got here in Charlie and priceless books, unusual life specimens, uh, and so forth. There's the explanation of what a gleaner is. So named for those folk who trail after the reapers in the field, picking up every grain which was missed. Aye, by all accounts, gleaning is the most meticulous and demanding profession. If these Talaferi make good on their audacious threats, then many uncatalogued rarities could be lost forever. Why else would the gleaners be buzzing about in such a frenzy? Watch the harbor, and you'll see what I mean. They're carting loads in from the docks all day. It's never been this hectic before. Not like this. The unusual crates that we've been getting, stuff like that. Okay, alright. Any trouble with the customers? Were you able to get anyone talking? Yes. Interesting. They seem unaware of the final days. Aside from whatever vague news the gazettes are printing, even Dickon had nothing to offer, and he's the best source of gossip in the city. Hmm. If the Forum does have secret knowledge, then they've done an impressive job of ensuring no one whispers in the wrong ears. In any case, thank you for playing the part so well. Here, that cup of coffee I promised. We don't get a cutscene, I wanted to drink it to oh, Okay, we do, never mind. I'm sorry, this is Final Fantasy, of course they're giving me a cutscene. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Yoshida-san, I apologize. I, was, I did a foolish thing. I should have trusted you. But let's enjoy our drink somewhere else, shall we? Maybe behind the peristyle, away from the gossips and the wagging tongues. I need to have a bonding moment with my girl. She is, I am sure, having a lot of big feelings right now inside about everything that's happening. And she can't really share them because she's not um, a crybaby like Alphino. So, <laughs> and I say this with love, I love Alphino. But that boy, a little bit of a crybaby. And that's okay because emotions are important. Having emotions, important. Sharing emotions, important. But I will say it's tough as nails. So you gotta kind of get through sometimes. Yes, this should do nicely. Out of the wind and out of sight. With only 500 other Warriors of Light here with us. <laughs> this is everything I ever wanted. This is so cute. Oh, the little heel rock animation. No. When our father disowned us, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. It wasn't until much later that his words began to sink in that I began to feel the weight of what it meant. Oh. Do you remember when the decision was made to come to Charlien? Grahal said that the Forum was determined to keep us in the dark, and that Father's venomous performance was part of that strategy, to keep us at arm's length. It kind of seems like it could be, but also, this has gone pretty far Perhaps above and beyond, right? Father argued with Grandfather on many occasions, but never with such dismissive contempt. Babies. And when he demanded what justifies the sacrifices we make in war, I honestly didn't know what to say. Neither did Alpha know, I know, but Aww. never for one moment did I believe we had made the wrong choice. 
So all I could do was fume silently. It was only afterwards that I realized how childish <laughs> I had been. How being stubborn and self-righteous must run in the family. If I could have just mustered a civil response, then things might have turned out differently. Oh, Alice, this is literally none of this is on you. That man did a mean, nasty thing. Doesn't matter if he's your father. It is not on you to repair the damage that he did. You know what I mean? It is his place to have to apologize and own up, and he should have never done it in the first place. Even if he was trying to separate them from something or spare them for something, not fair, not right. Suspicious shipments. Where are they going? So all those people that have those special backpacks must be gleaners. That makes sense. Oh, you know there's going to be tons of gleaner guilds and stuff now. FCs. A vast complex beneath the island. It's also uh, a fun detail that they've worked in the fact that Charlene kind of builds in a weird, I don't know, honeycomb thing almost. Because even in the, the city state of Charlene, the rem like the remnants and things, we can see that they burrowed into the earth, right? So uh, even in the uh, dungeon that Matoya has you do, if you go through there, you can see all the caves and the way that they had like cut out so much in that kind of floating hunk of land. The anti-tower, they were digging down into the earth trying to find the center, the ethereal core of, well, the Earth, Hydaelyn. The planet is called Hydaelyn. Um, trying to bury it, like, dig all the way down to that ethereal source in the sea. Charlian is famous for archiving knowledge from around the world. Well, that knowledge is not preserved exclusively in dusty tomes and desiccated samples. Our living library, comprised of all manner of flora and fauna, is housed and studied within that underground facility. Still, that did seem to be an unusually large shipment. When I lived here, it was rare to even see such cargo transported by boat. I mean, there was a lot of speculation early on that Labyrinthos was being used as almost like an apocalypse bunker. And then they came out with the details saying that it was actually like an underground repository of knowledge. It could still be, it could be like a Noah's Ark, right? Nuncrep's Ark, literally, where they're doing something, where they're trying to preserve all of the essence of the world and knowing that the rest of the world will be destroyed. I mean, I, oh, I don't know. I can't imagine that they would have so much contempt for life that they would say, our way is the true way of the future, so we're going to just make our new world. It'll be better if everybody else dies because didn't they bring it on themselves, you know? I, that would be villain stuff right there, uh, but maybe? I still think there's something more. Wait, didn't you hear something in the last stand about the gleaners coming and going more than usual? Well, I think they're the ones we saw manning those boats. And gleaners answer to the forum. Mmm, mysterious. If the of the Telophoroi prompted this sudden burst of activity, then Labyrinthos may hold a clue as to what the Forum is planning. I mean, for sure it does, right? Oh, we're gonna go to Labyrinthos next! New zone! Mm -hmm.